In this video, we'll be discussing part two of our polarity topic. Uh, it's going to discuss primarily molecular polarity. We'll start with a quick list of the learning objectives of this video. Uh, as a lot of the videos recently have started, there are a lot of necessary components to be able to determine molecular polarity. You need to be comfortable drawing Lewis dot structures, you need to be comfortable predicting Vesper shapes, and you need to be comfortable determining the polarity of individual bonds. If you do not feel comfortable with any or all of these topics, please go back and watch the associated videos and then come back to this topic when you're ready. We'll spend a little bit of time refreshing these ideas here, but that's not enough to get you prepared for the main concept. Uh, and that main concept being the idea of molecular polarity. We'll start by defining what molecular polarity is and contrasting it with the idea of bond polarity. And then we're going to start thinking of molecules as force diagrams, if you recall those last year from physics, where you have forces acting in many directions and you're looking to see what is the net force acting on your particular object. Once we identify all that and come up with a, uh, a methodology or a strategy for identifying molecular polarity, we'll put that strategy into uh, execution uh, with an example problem to wrap things up. Before we start, the last thing I want to talk about are the two structures shown below, or shown to the right. Uh, we can see here we have the molecule uh, hydrogen fluoride here. Uh, we've learned in the last video that fluorine is a particularly high electronegativity atom and very often involves in polar bonds where the electrons are pulled towards itself. This would definitely create a polar bond based on the rules we talked about before. This, however, is a molecule that contains many fluorine atoms. And while those fluorine atoms will all exert their pull on those electrons, we'll talk about later in the video that this molecule is actually nonpolar. Our job is to explain how, despite the presence of such a substance with such a strong electronegativity, is it possible to get a nonpolar molecule out of that. And again, that'll all come out as we talk about this topic. So very quickly, let's go through the review concepts here. We'll start with Lewis dot structures. They predict connectivity in a molecule, how atoms are connected together, but not any information about the shape. And as we said before, it allows us to take a formula for a compound and create a map of where the atoms are and how they're linked together. We then continue the discussion by introducing Vesper theory. It converts the two-dimensional Lewis dot structures into three-dimensional shapes of an entire molecule. It's based off the idea that atoms repel one another and as a result arrange themselves as far apart as possible and that determines the shape. This allows us to go from the two-dimensional Lewis dot structure into a three-dimensional representation of what the actual molecule looks like in three-dimensional space, how it behaves in the actual beaker. Last but not least then, in our review process, we talked about bond polarity. If you recall, bond polarity is caused by significant differences in electronegativity between the atoms across a bond. This causes an uneven sharing of electrons between the individual atoms, and it creates poles in our molecule, a positive and negative side. Electrons are pulled towards the higher electronegativity value. In this case, that again is going to be the element fluorine. We draw an arrow depicting that pull of electrons. And we can see in this picture, this large red region is where that higher density of electron-rich electrons are, and the electron-poor region over here creating the partial positive charge and partial negative charge we expect in a polar molecule. So that then brings us to the topic of today, the idea of molecular polarity. We'll start with a quick definition. A molecule is polar if it has an uneven distribution of electrons, and here's the difference, across the entire molecule. Bond polarity focused on just one bond at a time. This is across an entire molecule. This causes the entire molecule as a whole to have positive and negative sides. And this ends up being a very significant chemical property that turns a wide array of chemical phenomena in a substance. The most popular, the most, I guess, famous of all the polar molecules out there is this guy right here. And this is the depiction of the polarity of a water molecule. The oxygen in the water molecule has partial negative charges. 
whereas the two hydrogens have a positive partial positive charge. And we can see across this line here, we've got the negative pole on one side and the positive pole on another. That's what makes this molecule a polar molecule. Now this polarity of water is one of the things that makes water such an important and versatile compound uh, in the world around us, in your body, in, in the environment of our entire planet. It determines the ability of water to dissolve so many things. It determines water's boiling points and melting points and the density of water, especially the density of ice, frozen water, uh, which is actually less than the density of liquid water, a very uncommon property in substance but it's one of the things that allows ice to float on the top of lake streams and oceans as opposed to sinking to the bottom, killing everything underneath it. And then last but not least, a lot of the reactivity, the, the chemical nature of water is determined again by this polarity. So it's a very, very important characteristic when trying to understand the chemical nature of a substance. So let's continue then by talking a little bit more about how polarity is determined in a molecule. Uh, so to start this thought process, it's important to think of a molecule as being made up of, in many cases, many individual bonds, all of which each have their own individual bond polarities. Each bond polarity then acts like a force vector. If you recall last year in physics, you would draw pictures of objects and you would show forces acting on them in multiple different directions. Uh, for example, the force due to gravity pulling down, the normal force of the surface that this object is on pushing back up again, and then some sort of action force that you're exerting uh, based on whatever it is happening in the particular problem. These are all force vectors, and we're gonna think of bond polarities as being force vectors as well. Well, if you think back to how forces work, uh, we need two parts for a force, for any type of vector. Uh, each of those bonds has its own actual bond polarity value, which is similar to the difference in the electronegativities between the two atoms. And this gives us information about the magnitude of that vector, how long the actual arrow is. They also act in different directions. And the second part of a vector is that it had direction to it. It shows us which way that force is acting. The two of these things combined together is what creates the force vector. It's what creates this guy. Where is it pointing and how long is the line? How strong is the force acting? And we're gonna think again of our bond polarities now as being these types of force vectors. Pulling that all together then, if a molecule has a net pull, a leftover pull that isn't canceled out in one particular direction from all the individual bond polarities, then the entire molecule will have a positive negative sides. The entire molecule will be polar. And we're gonna think about this in the context of force diagrams like the ones we have up here. In these force diagrams, you did math showing where the forces were happening in each direction. You showed what forces canceled out and what forces remained. And that allowed us to calculate the net force on your object. If our molecule has a net force left over on it, then we would describe that molecule as being polar. This causes, as always, an uneven sharing of electrons, but not in a bond now, across the entire molecule that's caused by the unbalanced forces acting on those electrons. Those electrons get pulled by whatever force remains, and if the electrons get pulled to one side of the molecule or the other, it creates the partial positive and negative charges, and it creates polarity. So let's break this down then into a series of steps that you can use to determine molecular polarity of a molecule. You're first gonna start by having a accurate Lewis dot structure and Vesper shape for your substance. This provides us with a map to the molecule as well as the directions that all the bonds are acting in. Once you have those two things, you're gonna predict bond polarities for all the individual bonds showing which way electrons are getting pulled uh, in your particular atom. These will be your individual force vectors. We're then gonna use the Vesper shape and those bond polarities and arrows and create the force diagram for all of this. You're gonna see what forces are pulling in what direction and ultimately we'll use that for a tool to figure out is there a net pull in one direction or do the forces cancel out? If you find out there's an uncanceled force and electrons are getting pulled one way or the other, we would describe this molecule as being polar. If you find out that all the forces cancel out in every direction, we would describe that molecule then as being nonpolar. And those are really the two outcomes we're going to be looking for. What you'll find is that a lot of this math uh, is gonna be simpler than what we did last year in physics, and a lot of it is gonna boil down to this concept. 
If we can describe as be a molecule as being symmetrical, it's likely that the forces acting in that molecule will be symmetrical as well, and it's likely that it'll result in a nonpolar scenario where forces cancel out. Asymmetrical molecules, while not always polar, typically tend to be the molecules that are polar because asymmetry in the molecule creates asymmetry in the forces, allowing us to have a net force and cause polarity. Uh, but this is something you'll see a lot when you're looking at examples in the next couple minutes. So that's it in terms of the concept of molecular polarity. I think you'll understand it significantly better when you actually see it in action. Uh, and we're going to start with a very simple molecule that we started the previous part one video with, and that is carbon tetrafluoride. Uh, we're first going to need to see a Lewis dot structure for carbon tetrafluoride. Again, without going into the details, it's a central atom carbon with four fluorine atoms connected to it, nice and easy. We can then translate that into a tetrahedron, uh, or into a, a Vesper shape, and if you've been doing enough Vesper shapes, uh, that carbon atom tends to very commonly form a similar shape every single time. We've got the fluorines going in a tetrahedral configuration around the central atom, and it creates a shape that we've seen a couple times before that looks something like this. Looking up then electronegativity values, we can use that information to calculate bond polarities. Carbon's electronegativity is 2.55, while fluorine's electronegativity is 3.98. Without taking time to actually calculate the delta En, I can see that the difference is going to be significantly more than 0.4, telling me that electrons are going to get pulled towards the fluorine atom. And that's going to happen in each of these individual cases where we're going to have electrons being pulled from the central carbon atom to each of the individual fluorines. And now we've created our force diagram where carbon is the central point and the forces are now acting on it. The question is, is, is there a net force pulling electrons in one direction or another, or do these forces actually cancel? Well, because the molecule is symmetrical in all directions, the forces are the same in all directions. Uh, even if it's not super duper obvious to see, we can make the mental leap to say that these forces are going to ultimately cancel each other out. All the upward force acting in this particular bond here is being canceled out by the downward components of the individual forces pulling down here on these three four, uh, fluorine atoms. As a result, we would say that this molecule, despite containing a lot of polar bonds, we would say this molecule is non-polar. Now let's follow this up with a second example, a very similar molecule, except one of the fluorines in the molecule has been replaced with a hydrogen atom. Again, we can generate a Lewis dot structure with hydrogen at the top and the three fluorines around it. Doesn't matter how you orient them, it's just a, a picture of what's connected to what. And again, we can translate this into a Vesper shape. Again, we'll put that hydrogen at the top and we'll put in our individual fluorines around it. Bond coming out of the board and then bond going back into the board. And just like before, in order to continue now, we have to figure out the bond polarities of the individual atoms. Carbon is still 2.55, fluorine is still 3.98, and hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.20. Now that we've identified all the individual electronegativities, we can start calculating bond polarities. Uh, the carbon-hydrogen bond creates a difference of about 0.35, which is less than the cutoff of 0.4, meaning this bond would be nonpolar. Having some way to denote that one bond is nonpolar can be very helpful. Sometimes just drawing an X through it will get the job done. The carbon to fluorine bonds we identified last time as being significantly polar, so we can draw the vectors showing that for each individual case. And we get a similar outcome to what we saw before. The only difference is, is now we've got a lot of forces pulling downwards on electrons and no force pulling back upwards again. We have an asymmetrical molecule, which means an uneven distribution of forces. I would expect a net pull of electrons in the downward direction of this molecule, which will create a polar molecule. The bottom half of the molecule would have the partial negative charge because it has a higher density of electrons. The top half of the molecule would have a partial positive charge because it is missing a whole bunch of electrons. And as a result, we'll have positive and negative signs, which is the hallmark of what a molecule needs to be to be polar.
So that's pretty much the end. Uh, at this point in time, you should be able uh, to determine a couple things. Uh, the Lewis dot structure of a compound from a formula, the Vesper shape from that corresponding Lewis dot structure, bond polarities uh, by looking at the electronegativities of individual atoms, and then ultimately putting all of that together into molecular polarity by taking the individual bond polarities and combining with the idea of Vesper shape into a, um, into a force diagram. This is the kind of wrap up of a long sequence of ideas that started way back when with Lewis dot structures. Uh, but at this point in time, this is kind of the laundry list of stuff you guys should be able to do. If any of these topics seem difficult, uh, questions during class or review of videos is a tool you can use. I would say none of these things are super duper difficult to do, uh, but all of them require a decent amount of practice before you're going to be confident with the concept.